you can become the expert first and the the person who's on the front of the curve is going to make is going to be the first one out there and they're going to be more visible so they get more clients they'll make more money so try to get on the front of the curve as quick as you can yeah. because if you're on the front of the curve you don't have to be the best if you're the first Hey guys, welcome to The Creative Table. We're here today with our good friend, fellow creative, Brad Sitton. Brad, welcome to the table. Hey, thanks. Tell us about yourself, buddy. Okay, so my name's Brad. I make uh, I make stuff. And so it's usually in the media the media world. Started years ago in like the video editing, After Effects kind of world. That led into, as you know, After Effects led into DVDs, remember those? Which led into multi-screen kind of experiences. And those, that's led into building content and stuff for different events and tours and concerts, and that kind of stuff. And from there, it's kind of circled back into games. And so currently I have kind of three businesses. So I've got Blister Studio where I build content for experiences and events and brands and, and people and products and stuff. Okay. And I also have Crowd Control Games with my twin brother, Brian. Shout out crowdcontrolgames.com. Twin and brother. Twin brother. He's, very, right. he's the best looking guy I know. We have a company where we make games. Yep. Like they're interactive crowd games. So they're made for people with large events. So it's everything from, you know, people use them like schools and churches all the yep. way up to we were at Lollapalooza and we do cruise lines and, you know, some other stuff. And so and then we, so we have the kind of the consulting side of that where we actually produce game shows for for corporate. We sell the, the games on the website and then I make uh, videos and content and screens and designs for visual experiences for events. So those are kind of the three buckets that I live in right now. Blister, crowd control, yep. and then... What's the third one? Well, it's crowd control. We have the website, and then we have where we actually do the experiences and more the, we make custom games. So consulting for, and then like the experience yeah, uh, side so. of it. And consulting is an interesting way to look at because we, people will call us and they'll say, hey, we see these games. Can we customize those? So it's more of the customization side of that, and we make custom content. So mm -hmm. so Walmart uh, called us a couple of years ago, and they found us on Twitter. We only have like 100 followers. Yep. But Walmart found, found us on Twitter, one of their producers. Just so you know, Walmart, they produce over 360 events a year. So that's it's more than one. I mean, it's, it's like actually, every day Walmart's in an event. And, and, they're, and these aren't just small. These are massive events. And so they've got this, this incredible huge team. So they called us and said, hey, we're doing this event. Can you can we play? They'd seen Flappy Crowd, which is one of our games where a little bird goes up and down and the noise, the, the, the crowd <laughs> yells at the thing, makes the bird go up and down. It's a cheesy, fun little game. So we played that with them. They Every viewer it. today is going to get a copy <laughs> of Flappy. <laughs> 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 But they saw that, and so we started uh, talking with them, and then that yeah. led into a bigger conversation. And then, so like you know, two years later, we did a couple of events. With okay, them. okay. And so like we would do like they'll have like their like regional events, but then uh, I think it was two summers ago we did the Essence Festival. They do a music festival, and the Essence Festival. If you don't know about it, if you're white, you probably don't know about it. If I have any black <laughs> friends, I tell them I went to the Essence Festival, they immediately think I'm cool. It's awesome. I mean, it's, this oh, is, nice. It is this massive, massive music you festival. Have to check it out. And so when you're at this festival, so it's down this. Uh, uh, New Orleans, and when you're in there, it's this massive arena, and they'll have, or they have the arena with all the music, and then they have the whole conference center, uh, the convention center, and there'll be like Coke and and Ford was here, then Walmart was here, yep. and so they asked us to come in there, and just that they said, hey, our theme is kind of game mm -hmm. related, yep. so can you build custom game shows, or some custom games for us, like yep. arcade games? So we built them this whole arcade. And literally, we took like shopping carts and put sensors and stuff on it. And we made like the joysticks for okay. shopping carts and just oh, did, made all this ridiculous stuff. And then we also made this big interactive music machine. People could actually come and it was an interactive. People would step in and they're DJing. We had this whole LED booth around them. Super fun. But all that came from, just to tell you, it all came from one tweet from a, about Flappy Crowd. And that just blew up into that. So that's kind of our, that's our goal is we like to make stuff. Make the stuff that we like to make, stuff that we will make for fun, then fly, find clients who will pay us to make that for them. <clears throat> okay. That, that's the goal. I could go in a thousand directions from that alone. Okay. Let's back up. You're, you're a dad. Yep. Right? Yep. You mentioned you have a twin brother. Yep. You have kids? Uh, I have three children. Okay. So you have three kids and you have three businesses. Yep. Right? Yeah. Okay. So backing up, you started, you started in DVD authoring. That, that's not where I started. Okay. Point being, though, you have this, this whole litany of experience. You started with whatever, sketching, I don't know, drawing yeah. comic figures. Maybe you did like I did back in the day. You, I started in fine art personally. Yeah, yeah. And is that kind of your experience as well? Or did you start in fine art as, or did you just jump right yeah. into the digital side? Well, I think growing um, up, I was very, uh, I, I was never artistic. I never thought of myself as artistic. I was clever and creative. So we love to make things. Okay. So like, you know, everything from forts, like when we were in high school, we made like a, a suit of armor and wore it like for, because in class they'd say, hey, you can either write a paper or make a, make like a, 
uh, a thing on popsicle sticks. We made a whole suit of armor out of linoleum and spray paint. My brother walks in. It was, it was just, <laughs> we would always try to make something so ridiculous. See how this is, where this so is going. Was, so yeah, so I could see. Okay, so you've just always been interested in sort of the what could be. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And, and if they say you can make this or you can make what could be, you're like, I'm gonna make what could be. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So and for you, what that looks like was whatever the DVD authoring. You jumped into CG or, or motion graphics, and mm-hmm. you got into some 3D stuff. We we actually met that way 14 years ago. So how's that working out for you? How, what's been your how did you how do you keep all those plates spinning? Yeah. Um, while you're building your empire here. Yeah, I mean. well, it's, I always feel like it can do, it's like I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, and I'm a business owner. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like I can do two of those really well. And so I feel like if I'm, if I'm being a good dad and a good husband, then the business is struggling. Or if, if the business is really rocking and I'm being a good husband, I haven't seen my kids in a while. So keeping that balance has been very, very kind of tricky. Yeah. And so one of the things I did, I got my kids involved in the business. And so my, <laughs> <laughs> so my, my yeah. wife, you know, so she does all the books and stuff. But yeah. my, my, one of my, my oldest daughter is very artistic. How old are your kids? Uh, so my oldest daughter just turned 21. My son's 19 and Lola is 16. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm listening. Go ahead. And so, uh, so Bailey, she's been able to, like, she was the hand drawer. She could draw when she was born. I mean, she literally, as, a, as an infant, could, could draw. I mean, it was nuts. But I got her, so she started doing, uh, playing the computer when, before, she could, before she could talk. Then she started doing uh, Photoshop when she was like in like, you know, first grade. By third grade, I, had, I was working on After Effects. So by the time she gets to middle school, she's, she started teaching herself uh, Maya and, uh, and 3D stuff. Good Lord. So she's in high school and like she's almost outpaced me and she's doing stuff. So I would bring her into projects. Yep. So then I would bring my family in whenever possible. So. And your wife is... Totally outside of the creative industry. Is she creative yeah, as well? Yeah, she is. Well, see, the, the, she doesn't see herself as creative, but I think she's very creative. But okay. she's, uh, she's she kind of your your rock and brings you back down from yo, the clouds. One hundred percent. She's like like she's the realist. I'm the dreamer. Got it. And so creativity though isn't an ability. It's a mindset. Mm-hmm. And so creativity isn't something that like I'm clever, you know, and I like to problem solve. But creativity is more of a mindset. And creativity is. The ability to, it's that playful way to kind of solve a problem. Mm-hmm. So that's what I like to, I like to solve the problem and play around with it and have fun. Yep. And then, but the, the realist is, you know, that's my wife saying, well, you know, this is, this bill's due and this has to be done by Tuesday and it's, it's three o'clock in the morning. You should really get some sleep right now. So does she work in the company or no? Yeah. She does all of our books and stuff. So she's okay, been doing good. all the so paperwork. You've got yeah. some time there to figure that. Okay, good. To see them and keep them engaged and you kind of kill two birds with one stone or whatever. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. And you mentioned like what creativity is being a mindset and not something that you're, you, well, do you believe it's taught? Yeah, for sure. I mean, okay. well, it, can, it can be, okay. it can be because it's like most people think that it's, a, it's either born with it or you're not. And I, I 100% don't think that's right. Okay. It's 100%. It can't like if we're in a creative meeting, you have to teach people how to be creative within a creative meeting. There's the open mindset and the closed mindset. Right. And you have to be open to dream and you have to be close to get it done. Mm-hmm. And so some people are get her done. My wife, she's, she's creative, but she's a get her done person. Yep. And the realists are get her done people. And you have to have the get her done people, yep. but you have to know when to go from, I'm going to dream to I'm going right. to get her done. Put some practical steps. Uh, in I got to yeah, yeah. make that Action switch. steps. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I know myself enough to know that I love to live in the possibility and create what you know this vision, but I hate executing it. Like I love right. to hand that off and yeah. then maybe speak into it, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. like go over here and keep dreaming. Yeah. A lot of artists, creatives talk about how you get into this uh, role or position or that you start your company or you offer your services because you love what you do. Mm-hmm. And then one day you wake up and you are forced to do something that you no longer love because you've just had to sacrifice yeah. all your creativity for, yeah. at the at the feet of a client who maybe is yeah. a get or done person or, or lacks vision or doesn't yeah. have the budget or didn't give you the amount of time you need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you're, you're kind of just laying it down and going, okay, we'll do it that way. Sure. And then yeah. you, your creative soul has been sucked away. Right. But you're a guy who I've never seen that. I've never gone, Hey Brad, how you doing? It's like, Oh man, I, yeah, we're doing all right. We just, we're, ah, it's client. Yeah, you know? yeah. Never. You're always out there just going, Oh, so cool. You, you got to see what we're working on. It's just amazing. We've got this new thing. We built a suit that goes to, you hit a button and it explodes or what you always <laughs> <laughs> just doing these crazy Stop things. Don't tell people about the exploding suit. Right. Yeah. 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 So how have you maintained your creative integrity throughout your career, but also been, built your clientele, managed, you know, your, your, your relationships, both in the, in the business and personal sense, et cetera. So, okay. Confidence is sexy. Okay. okay? Sex sells, right? <clears throat> you're very sexy. So if you, thank you. So if you can have confidence <laughs> about what you're doing, yep. then you can most likely talk a client into it at least one time, mm-hmm. but you get one shot. 
And if it's not good, they're never calling you back. But if you can exceed those, exceed the expectations, yep. it's going to win. So years ago, this is, I'll take you back about a decade. So I was, uh, wake up in the morning, getting lots of work done, scrolling through, you know, my social feed or whatever. And I saw an ad for the Red Bull Flugtog. Now, see, you've said this, well, I don't know what you're saying. Okay, Red Bull. Okay, so you, Red Bull, the energy drink. Yes. Okay, you've heard of them. They sponsor an event called the Flugtog. It's, it's, it's German for flying day. Flying day. Flying day. So they invite amateurs to build a flying craft and they have a competition of who's will fly the farthest. Mm. And so literally we, we built a craft you go down to like we were into the one in Miami, mm -hmm. and you go up on this thirty foot like giant runway, and you run off into the ocean and see who can go the farthest. Ooh. And you actually fly this thing. So I'm watching this video going, "Oh my gosh, we could crush this. We'd be so good at that." So I call my brother, my twin brother, very yeah. good looking. So yeah. I call my brother, <laughs> and I said, "Hey, we need to do this." And yeah. and he's like, "He goes, we we could crush that." And I said, "Hey, um, what's your okay? Pause. What's yeah. his background?" Uh, so like engineering or something? No, uh, he was when, at this point, he was the vice president of a trucking company. <laughs> <laughs> true story. True story. So he was, okay. Working, he's like, he was, we do this all the time. And <laughs> <laughs> he was working at a trucking company. Yeah. Right. And so it used to be, so my, our, our family has a trucking company. So it used to be these people at Walmart or someone would call them and they'd give them this big stack of stuff and they'd give it to this team of people and they'd go in a back room and it'd take them a week. My brother figured out how to use like, the AS 400, a, a database mix them with Excel spreadsheet and he would copy this, do this. And he could do the whole process over a lunch break. And it was okay. just one thing. He just figured out how to optimize Love it. Excel. So it's really, you guys are like the Wright brothers moving <laughs> into this Red Bull thing. So back at the Red Bull thing, you're going to crush this flying so dealio. Tell I me about it. I called him. I said, I really want to, I really want to make a flying machine. I think we could do a really good job. I said, I think it's going to cost probably 15 to $20,000 to do it really good. And I said, we just need a sponsor. He's like, I'll call my boss. So we, he just went to me and said, hey, uh, if, you, if you sponsor this, we'll put your logo on this flying machine. It'll be totally worth it. And the guy's like, can you make it look like a truck? Done. Sure thing. So we put their logo on it. <laughs> they wrote us a big check. So we found a guy who makes stuff out of star foam. Yeah. And so he built us the whole truck that looked like the truck. Then the whole back end, we built a giant fabricated pipe. And so, so, so extracting out the little piece here, for me, what I'm hearing is, a lot of people look at something and see a problem or a bar barricade or a speed bump, and you guys just look at it and saw opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Yeah. So you're like, oh, there's this thing. Oh, we can figure that. Oh, that. Okay, so we'll go over here. Oh, yeah. oh and you're just like this energy, like water. It just keeps flowing around wherever yeah. there was, it just finds. You know, a, the hole, the crack, the crevice goes around. So keeps I'm, moving. I'm working on that project. So literally, yeah. we we've got this project, and it's like it was. It took us a, a few months to get it all built because we had to make the we made promo videos. And we did the stuff to submit to Red Bull to get just because they had to choose us. What was the timeline? Uh, we started probably it's probably about three months. They give you ninety because days. Okay. We, we, because we had to do the, the we make the first pitch, and so I made a video, and so because you know I knew how to do that, so I made a video of this is what we could do. Sent it to Red Bull, so then Red Bull caught us, and so Red Bull was okay. You're in. You're in the top. Tw there's twenty teams. You're one of the teams. And they called me a week later and said, hey, uh, we're looking for uh, uh, ESPN wants to cover this for one of their shows. Uh, we're looking for three people. We think you guys would be one of them. Should we pick you? And so I just sent back an email. I gave her the list. I said, hey, we do video stuff all the time. This will kick some serious ass if you pick us. <laughs> so, so, we, so we loaded that thing with the GoPros and right. we had everything. And so we had all that content that we were able to make Red Bull look good. We made ESPN look good. And then we also made the client finally at the end look good. Yep. So that project led to uh, another project where I was working on a, it was a more of a conference kind of thing. Yep. One of the guys uh, who worked there, I won't mention names, that he worked with the Falcons organization. So I did some work for them, did some projection mapping kind of stuff, which led to another project. He saw that project. And then when they were working on something for the Olympics, they came back and they said, hey, we're projection mapping on the, the curling on the ice. We need somebody who can do that. I um, said, I'm your guy. And so, now, have you ever said I'm your guy, even when you had no idea? Oh, 100%. Like, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> like, I mean, you just it, literally all that. I, we need someone to figure out how the, to, you know. So, the, the, well, here's what it all started. Like, I, okay, I'm going to take you, I'm going to go back again. I'm from the Ozarks sure. for storytellers. I'm going to go way back. If you go back to when I first started, you asked when I first started, my first job was literally I was editing videos and I had never edited a video before. And so they, they literally brought me a, a, a box of, of tapes and said, we need, to take you, we need you to take this tapes and turn it into a video. Yep. They handed me a book and said, learn After Effects and turn it into this. 
So I spent the next, you know, couple sem- you know, that, that semester at school, I would go to school, come home or come back to work and then just learn how to do After Effects, make a video for them and hand it off, say, do you like this? Like, well, let's tweak this and this. So I just kind of evolved because here's, here's what happened. While we're there, this is, this is like the late 90s. So uh, this is when digital video was just taken off. Yep. Okay, so imagine this is, this is before DV was really a thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just coming out. So DV comes out. So they had this, the, a card, it was a FireWire card that you could slap into your computer and then you could edit DV onto your digital camera. Well, they also had a codec that went with that, that if you installed that codec onto the new Apple laptops that had FireWire brand new on them. Mm-hmm. I figured out that if you played a, a, a video in QuickTime with that codec, it would play that video out the FireWire to the camera. I could take that camera into a switcher okay. and make multi-screen playback stuff. So I made a vi- like I made like a, 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 a like a playback system mm-hmm. before there was playback systems. I will. I mean, sorry, I made one for free, and yeah. so just yeah. out of QuickTime stuff. So that led into uh, getting three of those and having three computers and hitting the space bar, and you'd see all three screens light up. And all of a sudden, I can make multi-screen playback with just three computers with no software. So I started making stuff with with no, when the, before the software was really there. And so then as the software came on that would allow you to do that, I was able to learn that faster because I already knew the principles of it before it kind of happened. So then we started doing projection mapping. But before there's- what year are we in at this point? This would have been like 2000, uh, mid-2000s, so 2005, 2006, you're, doing, you're getting into projection mapping yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah, and so this is, and this is before I didn't know, I'd never heard that term projection mapping. Yeah. So then a few years later, uh, a friend calls and says, hey, we're doing a project, we're, we're going to be doing this install at the, um, it was an install, it was an event at the, um, Philly, uh, the Philadelphia Philharmonic. So we're doing the Philly Orchestra. And they want a projection map onto the, onto the columns and back behind it. I'm like, I've done that before the hard way, but I've heard that there's some software out there that can actually do it. So I literally took a job with the orchestra uh, from the Philadelphia Philharmonic and I'm literally, I don't tell them, <laughs> never use that software before in my this life. Part yeah, I never right. used it before. So we're literally, I, I remember sitting next to the guy and I'm telling him, like, oh, I've never really used this before. But we figured it out. Like, so I spent like the week before kind of figuring it all out. Whole thing okay, before so you're there. doing this huge work and, you're, and you don't know what you're doing. Like you're always paving the road. We're as figuring it out. Well, we're yeah, figuring yeah, yeah, yeah. We're but you always seem to be paving the road as you're going down yeah, yeah, because yeah. the road you're on is not the road everybody else. It's like the road less traveled yeah, is what yeah. you're constantly living yeah, yeah. on. But you're also having to seal deals with these big brands, these big companies, and there's contracts. I imagine, I imagine that are involved with that, right? I've, this all just, I've done this for 20 years. I've never had a real contract with anybody. Really? I've never signed. There's a never had to be a, a, a signature, a 20-page thing. Interesting. I've never made a single contract. Have you ever had to do like RFPs to get these uh, jobs, yeah. or has it always been relationship? It's it's almost always relationship based. So okay, we've got. Red Bull, Olympics, you mentioned uh, Mercedes, I think, at one point. You mentioned Philharmonic. Who, who are some other companies you've done work uh, with over oh the years? Man. Uh, we did a lot for Chick-fil-A for a while, yeah. and then we did some stuff for um, Golden Corral, mm-hmm. and then, you know, so all those kind of corporate kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been working a lot with some cruise lines, mm-hmm. uh, with Royal Caribbean. I hope we're still going to be working with them because with yep. all the pandemic going on, that's been how much? How, okay, so how much... Uh, how much time do you spend managing and fostering those relationships coming back around and going, Hey guys, how's it going? Yeah. You know, like, like keeping in touch or you just, you just chill and the phone rings one day and you've got a new yeah. job. I mean, how much business development and right, selling yeah. of your services and so forth do you actually have to do? So uh, I'm going to tell you two, two tricks. One, uh, so I'm in the event world, right? Yeah. And so in the event world, is that where you would sort of categorize yourself today? Yeah, I mean, say, I think I'm in so. events. That's where I feel the most at home. I mean, cause even with the, the games and stuff, yeah. those are all four events. When you're in the event world, the, the biggest thing is like people need someone who can solve the problem, right? Yeah. That's kind of where we're going with all that. But they're also like whenever you're on site, like they're, they're, you can just look around. People have their, their uniforms, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. So you go there and like all the tech guys are all wearing black. Yeah. And the, everyone's all blacked out. And the cam- you know who the camera guys are. You know who the audio guys are. Mm-hmm. But then what I started noticing is like all the talent always dressed a little bit nicer. And the producer, even though he was technically part of the crew, the producer and the director, those guys were always dressed a little bit nicer. And then they were kind of schmoozing with the talent. They were schmoozing with the the, the speakers, the, the clients and the speakers, yep. all that kind of stuff. So I thought, huh, 
what if I just started hanging out with those guys? Yep. And so all of a sudden it's this, this, this subtle Slow shift over. transition. Where's the, all the crew's like, where's Brad? Is yeah. he joining us from? Oh, Brad's with... Uh, and so that's the yeah. whole thing. It's like, don't think of yourself as a tech. Because a technicians are, I mean, as much as I hate to say it, like, that's a commodity. A commodity yeah. You can just, you, you can find another camera guy pretty easy. Yeah. But if you're like, if you're a, an entertainer, or if you're a, you know, if you're a, if you have a one specific problem that you're solving, they'll think of you as that person. Yeah. And so people go, oh, well, he's the guy that can do this thing right mm-hmm. here. So you have to be specialized, but then that's when you work the relationships. And whenever you're there, you know, oh yeah, well, I was working on this other thing. And you try to just kind of talk a little bit and just, you know, let them know that, you know, you can solve other problems yep. without them knowing that you're actually pitching to them. So you're building, you're spending time strategically now engaged with the basically the client mm-hmm. more so yeah. than just the fellow crew members because yeah. they're not paying your bills yeah. later on. So you're building under- relationships, but you're also now coming over here and saying, okay, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're building your brand with yeah. these people. Yeah. So when the event's over and now they go on and splinter off, they, yeah. they've got your information and, and they understand. And you, you know, have to be very, very careful of that because if you can't be at an event just handing out business cards. No, no, absolutely you not. You cannot do that. And so, so usually what I try to do is it's, it's like that's that it sounds like I'm just around schmoozing the whole time. Right. It's very purposeful, and it's like you're right. gonna pick like there's like one person that you're gonna figure out, and so you kind of study the crowd. Go, okay, these people here, okay, that person right there, that's the person I need to talk to. That's who I can connect with later. And you don't talk to them and say, hey, I'm Brad, I'm the, I'm this guy. You just kind of start talking with them, right? And, and it is, it's what you said. You just build that friendship and mm-hmm. kind of build that relationship. When when we got the the Norwegian cruise line thing, this is a this is this is how it works, right? We were on a cruise with my family and we, we were walking through the, the atrium one day and we see a game show going on. We'd made games and I look and I go, oh, I'm just curious, we, I'd made games, and they're making games, I wonder if I can make my games better to match theirs. I walk up and they're playing, it was literally a PowerPoint, like if this is a PowerPoint screen, the people are, are on the stage and you see them, they get a question wrong, you see the mouse come over and click on the screen and go, <laughs> and I was just like, oh, Painful. you're kidding me. So I just walked down, so I just said, I told my wife, I said, hey, um, Give me 10 minutes. I'm going to just go talk to someone. I'm going to go yeah. land a new client. Yeah. I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> so I find the person who's operating it. Yeah. And they said, I said, hey, uh, I make games. I'd love to talk to someone about, you know, possibly helping you guys, you know, make something. And they said, oh, you need to talk to this guy. So I talked to that person. He goes, oh, you need to talk to the, to the, uh, our, the cruise director. So the next thing I know, I'm having coffee with the cruise director and just said, hey, this is what we can do. So I'd like to do. And they were, uh, they said, oh, this is fantastic. So uh, we, we exchanged emails. We sent emails back and forth. And we sent him some, some some software. Didn't hear back from him for a year and a half. Oh. And we thought, well, that's done. And then all of a sudden, a year and a half later, we get an email from uh, over from, the year and a half. You're touching base, and they're ghosting no, you, or nothing, you just you just nothing. You just, just you didn't email them. They didn't email you. Complete silence. We'd kind of almost forgotten about it. And then we got a, an email from who was the you know one of the directors of entertainment, and she said, hey. Uh, I got your email from this person. We'd love to talk to you about games. That's so crazy. A, yeah, so it was a, so that's the whole th- the trick is you can go into it and say, hey, here's a solution we already have. Yep. Then here's how we can make it custom for you, and then we can also dream with you. Yes. And, like, and that's where you want to get your client to, hey, when you dream of stuff, think of us. We want to dream yeah. with you. Yeah, that's and that's good. where we always try to get clients to, uh, to where we can dream with them. Okay. You know, it sounds like you do not suffer from analysis paralysis, right? You obviously weren't, you know, born knowing how to do that. So you got to go learn to code or do you hire an external developer? So Brian's doing all the coding. But he had to teach himself that then. Right, yeah. Okay, Completely. so how much runway do you need to learn that, right? Or yeah. do you just go, I don't know, but we're going to start. We're going to make Pong first and make <laughs> that, it super dude, simple. That's what we did. That was our first thing. <laughs> so, Perfect. So it's like, like you get started. Yeah. You don't wait. For, you know, I'm going to take five years yeah. to become an expert developer yeah. and then start my company learning right you just got started and you we, immediately we literally the probably f- got a client to pay for it too right and i mean you're like, like i'm gonna learn this and so you're gonna pay me to learn it and you don't know it but i'm gonna so we so we, made that, <laughs> so we made that i literally we made that i went across strad a friend over there who's doing uh the catalyst conference yep. and i said hey check out what check out what we just figured out and they were uh, catalyst that year was giving away a car Okay. So we said, hey, what if instead of Pong going up and down, it was a car going up and down? Oh. We said, hey, can we do this? They said, yes. I said, will you pay us to do this? He said, yes. I said, okay. So we start building it. Brian flies into town. Catalyst is on like a Tuesday. We're driving from my house to the event, and we're finishing the game in the car. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you haven't like, even li- tested it. <laughs> like literally, like, I was finishing like, graphics, and I put it on a flash drive. I'm on a Mac. He's on a PC. I put the graphics on a flash drive. We are halfway, it's a, it's a 45 minute drive to the arena. Halfway there, we, we literally add it, like pull over, switch seats, and I hand him the thumb drive. He puts it in and he put, drops it in a thing, finishes the code. We pull in there during a break 
and we put it up on the screen and the first time we ever played it was in front of 10,000 people. <laughs> it was just, That's it was nuts. crazy. It was, it was great. We were, we Sounds were, like a story straight out of Hollywood. That we was the way a lot of films sure. happen uh, in some ways. We were pretty sure it was going to work. Yeah, but yeah. It was, but it was we're just pretty like, sure. That's, uh, that's good. But, and it did. It worked out great. And so because of that, so that was our first game. Yep. And it just happened to be in front of like 10,000 people. Yep. But then from that, then we didn't really think about it too much. And then we made another one for fun. We made another one for fun. And then someone called and said, hey, can you make a game show? And they just kept growing from there. All right. So you're doing all this stuff. You got all these different games. You got you're, all these different in, you know, ingenious ways of putting things together to solve problems for people, which is what I want to also circle back to here in a minute. Um, but how, where do you find the time to do it? I mean, I'd ask you, do you sleep at all? But of course you do. I mean, you got three kids. It, it depends on the project, for sure. But like the big thing with like... I don't have like a lot of hobbies. Like p- some people like they do like fantasy sports or they they'll go have they have friends. I mean, yep, I, I just friends. I'm not a social person. Yep. And so it's like making things is what I do for fun. Like now I work from home and I'm literally like I just walk out of my office and I'm in the kitchen. And so like I was like so now like dinner time I try to protect dinner time as much as possible. Okay. So dinner time and then any kind of family time. You shut the phone off. Shut, yeah, try leave the phone in the office. And sometimes I used to have my home office as well and I would think you know, this is great. But then I would find myself, when your office is at home, you're always at work. Yeah. Oh, that's, Even if you go next door to the kitchen, if you, you're sitting at the kitchen eating dinner going, how can I get yeah. the code to work with yeah. the thing that I need to... If um, you own your own business, you never have a time off. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, it you're, feels that way you're always right? working. I mean, because yeah. like you're on vacation, but you're still taking a call from that client. You right. know? And that's what you have to be, you know, be careful you of. You set healthy boundaries with your clients? I mean, do you not respond after 5 or 6 p.m.? Yeah, or I mean, how do you... Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> For the most part, yeah. Like, I've definitely, some are, I mean, the, the best part about, you know, I was talking to Andy earlier, is, uh, like, I feel Whip like... Whip to Andy. Whoosh! Snapchat. Uh, <laughs> so, hey, it's, hey, it's there Andy right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but sometimes the clients last for, I mean, on average, a client lasts about three years. And you just got to know that. Your, your clients are going to last about three years, and then they're going to kind of go away, and you're going to find new clients. And then sometimes, three or four years later, that client will come back. But they only last for a season because I'm not like a fixed need. I'm not like something that's always time. I'll come and solve a problem there for a couple of years. They'll, they'll remember me and then they'll go find somebody else. They'll find a new flavor. They'll find a new, someone who can solve that. And then you come back in a little bit later. So constantly trying to f- shuffle that through is, is super helpful. When did you realize that? Or did you just know that from day one? No, 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 no. It took, did you learn that the hard way? Yeah. It's, I mean, honestly, because you, you do it for a couple of years and you realize, well, I used to have these clients and they never call me anymore. Yep. Or I, I don't see these people anymore. It just kind of, it was probably about five or six years ago, I kind of realized, oh, they kind of circle back around. And mm-hmm. like, in some clients you have to take a break from. Because uh-huh. I, was, I was literally working a project. I was down in Florida working at an event. And someone calls and they said, hey, remember that this is a client. They were good. They paid me a lot of money over the years. And they said, hey, remember that project that we did like two years ago? Uh, they, they, our, our client wants to use that again, mm-hmm. but they want to make some changes to it. Yep. And we need it by like Tuesday. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm at an event right now. I'll, I'll be there the whole weekend. I said, I can get to it in two weeks. And they said, no, no, it has to be now. And I'm like, no. And they said, you have to do it right now. I'm like, what? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, and it also, and it was like. Go back to that whole confidence thing you were was, talking about earlier. Yeah, and it, was, well, it was the whole thing. Of, like, I finally realized sometimes you need to fire a client. Mm. And at that point, I, because I, at first I was like, I called my wife and she, and I, I kind of told her and she's like, so? And, and I'll, it just, and it was like this epiphany of, I don't work for them. They're not, I don't owe them anything. I mean, granted, I, do I want to do business with them? Yes. If I can't do it in the future, right. will I find someone else? Yes. And all of a sudden, it was this freedom of I'm not chained to these people anymore. And uh-huh. so your demands. So now I want to make. I want you to be. I want you to be my best friend. I want you to love me. I want you to just think. That is a thing a lot of creative suffer from, it's right? So, we love people. We love yes. the, the approval. I should say yeah, the want, the acceptance, yeah. the affirmation. Well, our identity. Words of affirmation is yeah. like, oh, yeah. I need you to tell me like how good a job this was you're, for you, and, and I need you to like to be my friend, yeah. and I need you to like be at peace with me and I don't want to upset anyone. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll, yes. Okay. You don't have the budget. I'll bend over backwards and give you yeah. all this work. And, yeah. and, and yeah. anyway, so you're saying no. So, I, yeah. So at, at that point you learn to fire a client and then all of a sudden it was like, okay, I'm free. And, and you don't, there's wanna, a respect that happens yeah, there too. I think yeah. it's like pruning, right? You no, have to kind of sure. prune your yeah. clients, prune the, what you, your services or what yeah. you agree to and kind of bring it back. And then out of that, out of that, a new yeah. healthier relationship will, will grow. Because then they'll also ask you like, you know, I do like, if I do motion graphics and I do uh, environment kind of stuff, they call and said, Hey, can you do t-shirt design? I'm like, mm. well, I could figure it out, but that's not what I'm good at. Right. So you got to be also be, you know, who do you want to become? 
because you are whatever you choose to do that's what you become and so if you're if you can design t-shirts and you're really good at it and you like it and you start doing that you'll become you're a t-shirt be, guy you're not as a t-shirt guy that's but right but then but you might not want to be the t-shirt guy so if, if find out who you want to become and then start doing that you know only do not, what you can do great yes because if you can't do it great then don't do it and i've also heard this it's an interesting uh point it's kind of a segue you know because my buddy used to tell me a long time ago like work work begets work mm -hmm. so yeah. what you do you will be known for doing right yeah, yeah. but i've also heard uh in terms of pricing that's that work okay is that you all your work you do at full price or you do it for free okay because yeah. mm -hmm. If you do it for full price, you 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 you're doing it the way with excellence, the way you know you need to to be healthy, and it, and if you do it for free, well then I'm just this is something I'm I'm I believe in. I'm doing this for free. But if you do it for a discount, now you become known as hey, call Brad. Right. He's the guy that'll give you a discount. Right. Like he's expensive, but he'll give you a discount. Right. Call Brad. He's the He's the fifty percent off. They, you'll never be able to do it for full price again. Right. Uh, and, and and in a way, I'm kind of associating that a little bit with you know. Hey, you're the t-shirt guy, or you're yeah. the you're the pyro guy, yeah. you know, or whatever. It's like I, you, you kind of have to live confidently uh, in, in in what you do and stand there, you know. Right. In, in I, I had a friend the other day, and he uh, we were just at dinner, you know, with our wives or friends, and so and you know he knows that I do video stuff, mm -hmm. and he was about to shoot a video, and he goes, "Hey, can I hire you?" Because he was filming something, and he showed me what he filmed, but he filmed it on his phone. Yeah. And if he's watching this right now, sorry, but uh, uh, but he showed me what he filmed. I said, "Oh, dude, next time you're doing that, just." Get your sight line up here and do this and oh and do that and I did been a couple of tweaks. I'm literally just kind of dancing him around, moving him around and line up. Like, Put your camera here, do this. Yep. And he's like, "How do you know all this?" I'm like, "This that's what I do. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years." And he, <laughs> goes, he goes, "Can I hire you?" But I, it's exactly what you're saying. If I go in there for a reduced rate and just say that's what I'm doing, so I just said to him, "I said you can't afford me." And he goes, "Well, how much do you charge?" And I said, "Well, I mean, it's, it's usually a thousand bucks a day, and I, I, you're my friend. I don't want to charge you that." And so all of a sudden it's like you say, well, it's, it's here's the number, but you're my friend. I don't want to charge it. Let me just do it for you for free. Then if he comes back and says, well, hey, just let me, let me give you some money for, for gas and stuff. Right. And then he ends up giving me a couple hundred bucks just as, as a thank right. you. Mm -hmm. That's not my day rate. And it's not, right. it doesn't label you. So if you can figure out ways to kind of make some money, but mm -hmm. not being labeled as that's what my day rate is. The discounted is, cheap labor guy. Make yeah. sure you know. Commodity. That's like my, so my daughter is, you know, so she's kind of getting into this now. And so the other day, I was so proud. She sent me a text message. She goes, oh, my gosh, this guy wants me to make eight videos for him for the for some kind of woods, uh, some wildlife refuge kind mm. of thing. And she goes, he wants me to do like eight videos. It's just a couple of these parts like that. And then he goes, and then like 30 minutes later, I get another text from her. She's like, no way. And I was like, what? And, she, and he had said, I, I'll give you like $100 to make these eight videos. Oh. And, and, and he, his thing was like, but you'll get good exposure. You're in college. Oh, there this, we go. This will be good exposure. There it is. But, I didn't, but she already knew from, from the years of training, yep. she knew, well, exposure is not where it's at. Yeah. So she, as soon as the, the power company starts taking exposure payments, <laughs> right, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll consider your offer. But, it's, but it's, 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 yeah. when you're first getting started, though, it's very tempting. Right. But I would say when you're very first started, find other people who are doing awesome stuff and go help them. Your proximity to to awesome will make you a better person. Yeah. And okay. So when when people sign anything, well, you never sign anything. Yeah. I don't. I don't you're just it's, like a nomad or something. <laughs> okay, so, nomad. so, so how do you? Well, I need to ask. Like, how do you scale a company of one? Play like you know, if we go back like you know eight or nine years. I was trying to figure out because I am a one man show. Right. How do I market myself? Yes. Because it's like you know, as a business owner, you got to be three people. You got to be the craftsman. That's what we love to do. You right. also have to be the manager and manage your time. But you also have to be the entrepreneur and market Vision yourself. Yep. Yeah. So what I do now is <laughs> you have a client and say, hey, the stock footage uh, of that's going to be about it's about twelve hundred dollars in stock footage to make all that happen. So then you go buy a, a you know a thousand dollars in credits in stock footage. Use eight hundred. Now you got four hundred to work with. Yep. So then you can. So it's like the same thing. If you uh, if you're renting something for the weekend, if you you rent three cameras, rent them on a Friday. Do the shoot on Friday, return them on Sunday or on Monday, but then over the weekend, that's when you make your personal project. <laughs> and, so, you know, and so that's and so that's yeah. what I try to do now is whenever possible, leverage other people's money to grow my business whenever right. possible. This is my kind of my philosophy on pricing. Yeah. Whenever I start a new client, I like we have to have a conversation, right? Because if okay. they say, Hey, I want you to make me this video, like I can make a two minute video and a twenty minute video, and they can be the same price. Mm -hmm. Or I can make a 20 second video and it's the same price as a 20 minute video because it depends on how much work you're going to put into it and how creative, you know, how complex the shot, the shot is. And so 
you have to have a conversation with the client and say, okay, here's what, what's your goal? What, what, what do you, how do you want me to solve this for you? And they'll say, this is what, we, this is what our expectations are. And then from that, you say, okay, well, you don't know what I can do. If I tell you this is going to take me 20, if I say, I'm going to charge you hourly and say it's going to be a hundred bucks an hour. If I say it's going to be a hundred bucks an hour, you don't know what I can do in an hour. Yeah. If I say it's going to be a thousand bucks a day, you don't know what I can do in a day. Right. And so there, it's very difficult to, to lay that all out. So you have to kind of start with some samples and say, well, do you like this? This project cost, this is about a $10,000 project. This is a $5,000 project. This is a $20,000 project. Which one of these do you think you are looking for? Yep. And so whenever possible, and, and I oftentimes, this is the line I use on clients a lot, say, I don't really care what the budget is. Because to me, if it's, it's, it's going to be based on my time. I'm going to value it based on my time. So if, if, if it's a big thing, I'm going to spend a lot of time doing it. And if it's a smaller budget, I'm going to spend less time on it. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter to me. So if you want to, if you want to give me $2,000 or $20,000, I'm still going to be your best friend. Right. And so and that kind of that takes the, the pressure off. Because some people think, oh, if I'm not going to pay this guy at least this much money, he won't really value me. I'm going to say, no, I'm going to value you. I'm just going to work less hours for you. Right. <laughs> it's, like, it's real simple. And so, so I'll have, paint the Mona Lisa in yeah. oil or I'll <laughs> right. use crayon. Yeah. And so it's up to you. It's up to you. Yeah. And so having that conversation and just taking, because that takes the pressure off. Yeah. But have that conversation sooner than later. And then and, totally. And do you know the, the, the pyramid? So this is like whenever Good, we Good, fast, do, and cheap? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Is that what? It's like the, 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 the triangle for project management. Okay. So you have your There's a lot scope. of triangles going on here. Okay. So uh, the, the scope of everything, how, how big is it going to be? Yep. Your schedule and resources. So scope, schedule, resources. So you once you establish that, that's your original budget. That's the initial email. You'll, they'll say, hey, can you do a project for us? Well, what are you looking for? Well, this is what we want. Okay, well, I can do this in this amount of time for this amount of money. Mm -hmm. And then if they agree to that, if, once you lock those three things in, if any one of those change, it's going to affect the other two. So if they come back and they say, hey, actually, they cut the budget, then all of a sudden, okay, well, we can now reduce the scope and make this a much smaller thing, or we can, uh, we can adjust the, the schedule and we can put this in like, you know, in a few months when we don't have any other work coming in. Yep. And so, and then, or if they come back and they say, hey, this has to be, we need this a lot sooner. We'll say, well, then your options are you can either we can either reduce the scope so we can have more time or we can increase uh, increase the scope, the budget. Yep. Which do you want to do? And so having that basic triangle is a real quick way to as soon as someone says, hey, I need to change this and say, well, here's your options. And you give it right back to them and let them solve that problem. Yep. So right. we were uh, we were doing a, a pitch for uh, for a different organization. Mm hmm. And they said, hey, we're, we wanna, we're doing this 10-minute, uh, uh, in this big conference, we have like a bunch of people there. We have this 10-minute stretch, and we want to play some games in there. And so we were working with the producer, and we said, well, hey, here's two games we think could play that. We can work with your, um, we can work with your host. We can work with your AV guys. And we can make this yep. a really, a really amazing 10 minutes. And we said, what's your budget on this? And the, this is one of the best lines. The producer is this lady from, from Nashville or New York. She said, they're expecting a $10,000 solution. I thought that's really interesting because we could have sold it to them for a thousand bucks. We, Brian and I, we were, we were ready. Like we wanted to do this event because we were trying to get our foot in the door with, yep. with this client, and so we were, we had talked about it. The games are already made. It's just our time. Right. So we're willing to sacrifice. So we're thinking, well, we could just for a thousand bucks. But she came back and she said, no, no, no. They want a ten thousand dollar solution. If you sell them something for a thousand dollars, they've only got a thousand dollar product. That's not. That's they're trying to build this big experience. Perception. The expectation was we need a ten thousand dollar experience. So our our workload didn't change very much at all, but we're, but our our value changed greatly. Right now, granted, when we got there, you know, we were a little bit more tentative to them, you know, to their needs. You know, if they needed anything, well, yes, ma'am. Dress yeah. a little nicer we, than those we crew members. Bit, yeah, we were a little bit. <laughs> had, but but right. but just knowing the expectation of of how you value yourself, if people see you as the five hundred dollars solution, they'll see as that. But when they see you as the five thousand dollars solution or the ten thousand dollars solution, then they're, they're like, there's a perceived value there that's really really important. Mm -hmm. and, and they want that. Yep. And so if, so if they want it, you might as well offer it to them because you can literally underprice yourself and lose the bigger clients. Yeah. And so if you're wondering how, how do you go, you got to work yourself up the food chain. You, when you do something, like honestly, like if I, the difference between a Hollywood film and a YouTube video, you can tell the difference, right? You know, like if someone shot something on YouTube, like a fan film or something. Sure. And you see Hollywood, it's like, it's like perfect. There are some credible fan films. There, there are some yeah. very good ones. Yeah. But if you, but if you, when you watch the credits, when you watch mm -hmm. the credits roll at the end of a Hollywood film, the credits go on for 15 minutes. I mean, it's like there's so many people involved oh, in yeah. that because one person will take one very specific job and they will spend weeks and months on one small thing. 
And so what happens is if I'm, if I'm working on the, the lower end food chain, you've got one person who's going to do 12 jobs and he's going to do them as quick as he can and move on to the next one. And so what happens is you go up the food chain, you're spending more time focused on, on, on fewer things. And so whenever you're going to go up the food chain, you have to kind of specialize or you have to kind of get a focus and go, I'm really good at pulling keys or I'm really good at, at sound design or I'm really good at one thing. Now, granted, I can do all these other things, but you need that one thing and kind of get you there. And then once you're there, you need to spend some more time and, and the expectations are higher. And that's one of, one of the things that makes you better is being around a place where the expectations are higher. If you're doing wedding videos and the, and you can just and they're just the expectations not there they just want to see themselves on a video then that's the expectation that's what you're going to do if you're doing a, a commercial uh, for the local local syndicated television the expectation is I just want to see myself there if you're doing a national spot the thing is it has to be perfect you know the the time it has to be this exact time this exact format mm -hmm. everything has to be. And the expectation is more, and so you perform better. So it's almost like you just raise your expectations. So if you can put yourself in situations that have high expectations, the stress level is going to be high. Right. But it's going to it's going to force you to do better, or you'll fail. And it's like, and that's why most people who are doing good, they just it's the Peterson principle. You will you will accelerate to the point of your incompetence. Mm -hmm. And so the trick is just to be as competent as possible. So say, so, is that the sitting principle, <laughs> the Peter sitting principle? <laughs> but I think that's the, that's just the whole thing. It's like yeah. you need to live, raise your, your competency yeah. to a point where people can take you up. And so if you're not there yet, go learn something new mm -hmm. or really polish what you already know. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things we can keep talking about, but I got to ask just foundationally, you know, there's always that question of like, what do you know today that you wish you'd known in the beginning? Whatever you want to speak to, regarding what you know today, I know you, you've got all this experience, what, what kind of comes to the surface for you? The first thing I, I think is most people, when they're first starting off, there's a lot of fear. And there's the fear of, am I good enough? And so essentially when you're first starting off, you've got, you usually have a good eye and you can see what's good and you can critique it and say, okay, that's not good. And then when you start building stuff, you go, well, my, I know my stuff, I've got a good eye and I know that my stuff's not good. And so they'll, 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 they'll give up. And so you have to keep progressing. You got to keep getting better and keep getting better and keep getting better. And so then when you get to the point where your stuff is as good as the stuff that you like, then there, there's the tendency to, okay, I've arrived, I'm done. And I think there, there's two things. You're always going to have the fear because if you're, if you don't have, if you're not afraid of what you're doing, then you're not pushing yourself enough. So there should always be this fear of, am I pushing too far? Is that client too big? Is this, is this, is this too, too bold of a move? You should always be pushing that. There should always be a sense of fear. And the way you overcome fear is through curiosity. And you have to be so curious about what would happen if. What if I did do this? What if we did step out there? That's what I need to do. And so you'd be super curious about that. And you mix that super curious with that progression. And you keep pushing yourself into trying new things. Learn a new app. Learn a new technique. Figure out a new way to solve a problem. And it's that combination. It's that kind of that two approach of... I, I, I totally want to progress. I totally want to keep on growing this and just keep pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's as, so when you're first starting, start, when you're first starting off, there's the fear of, well, why do I have a voice? Why do I even matter? Or the, uh, well, there's also the people who are like, are overly confident, but just, just have this, this, this con uh, the, the concept of just continually trying to, to push yourself in, yeah. into, into new things. And so, yeah. It is funny too, because I know there's such a thing as imposter syndrome where yeah, you're an yeah. expert at what you do, For sure. but then it comes time to do it and you're like, ah, I'm not the guy. <laughs> I, don't, right. I'm not, I don't know enough. I'm not, I got somebody else is better. There's always someone else better. So there's much, always someone else worse. You are, yeah. you know, the right person. Yeah. And it's good. It's interesting you say that. It's good to mention because I, I was watching a documentary uh, and HBO put out uh, a year or two ago about Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And um, he talks in there about how every single time he comes to set, he's afraid. Like yeah. he's like, he feels inept or he feels yeah. inadequate or he's like, what am I doing? Yeah. And I'm like, what? You're like, you're Steven yeah. Spielberg. What yeah. are you talking about? Right. Yeah, and Lucas you know. had a very similar, there's, there's, it's called, if there's a documentary Empire of Dreams, mm -hmm. it's about the making of, uh, of the first Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was a train wreck. I mean, it was just a complete, no one thought it was going to work. The actors right. didn't know what was going on. The people, but they were making incredible right. stuff. The story was a mess yep. and literally it got saved in the edit. 
Like the only reason, there's two things that made it work. It, it got saved in the edit and they re-edited, cut and dropped a whole bunch of stuff. That's why it's called A New Hope because yeah. the editor, <laughs> <laughs> the, the the editor like, and then, there was no hope for it. it, 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 it seriously, it was so bad. People mm-hmm. were like, this is, this is, this is, this is it. Yeah. Then they go in over like, literally like over a, a few days, redo the edit, hand it off and it gets the best score of all times. Oh, yeah, right. And so John Williams and the editor literally turned that into one of the what best movies is. I've ever, ever made, yeah. which is crazy to think about. But what's great about that, whenever I'm feeling like I'm, I'm in over my head or I've lost, I just think to myself, I, I should save it in the edit. And so then there's, we, always have, we always have that chance. No matter what the project is, just edit it. Just chop off something. What, what, can, I, what can I cut out of this? Mm-hmm. What can I just keep cutting stuff, cutting stuff until you have the, the good stuff yeah. and then build off that a little bit. So, so today, Brad sitting today, you've got all this experience, worked with all these clients, your dad, what gets you up in the morning today in terms of your, your business, your work? What are you excited about? What are you learning? What's challenging? What's scaring you today? Mm-hmm. And where are you going tomorrow? That kind of thing. Um, I think, uh, I mean, last year was probably the, one of the best years I've ever had. Okay. 2019 was awesome. Mm-hmm. And it was like literally, it was a lot of events. And so we had sold lots of games to cruise. And so I literally would, was, would be at an event in Nashville and then fly to Miami, jump on a cruise ship, be on a cruise ship for a week. To train them on how to, how to do uh, how to produce a game show, then fly back do another event, and then would be home for a week or two, and then all of a sudden, the industry just implodes, yeah. and so li- like literally the, the event industry it's not just it's not, it's gone like it's it's been destroyed. It's like it's not just what we're looking for for work right now. There's no industry to find work in. So yeah. now so there now there's the pivot of trying to find other stuff, and so. So what gets me up in the morning is there's there's two things we're we're making games and so what we realize is events of of you know 500 or more are are kind of gone. There's still a lot of events with like a few hundred. There's virtual events. There's a lot of people doing Zoom calls. So what we said was you know what we make games for crowds. We're crowdcontrolgames.com. And so so we're making we're making so if if I if I if I'm a crowd engagement specialist, where are the crowds actually at? So we had to start looking for so we said well they're on Zoom. So we realized that even though the industry's gone, there's still crowds of people. You know, there's not more than 500. There's, you know, less. Yeah, people went somewhere. People went somewhere. And a lot of them went to Zoom. It didn't disappear. This isn't Thanos. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So immediately they were on Zoom. And if you remember, like, right afterwards, I mean, everyone was on Zoom, like, those first couple of weeks. So we immediately start thinking, okay, how do we solve that problem? And so that's, so we just kind of pivoted because we had multiple businesses or because, like my wife said, you know, don't, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket yep. because we had multiple baskets. When they all fell, we were able to land on the game side of it. And so we put some stuff in um, uh, into Zoom. And then all of a sudden, when summer hits, everyone had Zoom fatigue and then they were all gone. So then we started making new games. And it's just it's always just looking for where's the crowd? Who's got money and how can I get it from them? Yep. <laughs> and that's the big thing is who needs help right now and how yeah. can we help them? When, when, when it first started, and the thing that made this one really awkward is it was this slow crumble and it was gone. And so we just saw this slowly erosion and then it was gone. Now, some people like my neighbors, like they're working from home, but they still have jobs. This is like, I didn't just lose my job. It's the industry was gone. So like, there's nowhere to even look for a job. And so the, the, the worst thing that can happen, I've, 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 I spent like two weeks ago, I went around and just started checking in on friends. And I talked to like, talked to one guy who was just battling depression one guy has like his, his marriage is in really rough shape. So I started kind of checking in on people. And so whenever the industry falls apart, just, just try to help people. And so instead of helping clients, then it becomes helping friends. Mm-hmm. And but just keep helping people. And I think that's the secret is essentially businesses that win are ones that help a lot. Like Amazon is crushing it right now because they're totally helping it. And if your industry isn't there, keep helping people. That's a huge point. Businesses that win are the ones that help a lot. Mm-hmm. And so keep helping. So mm-hmm. even if you don't have an industry, Find someone to help and be in the stay in the habit of helping, because if you're helping people solve problems and, and you know, doing things, then you you're just, then when your work starts back up, those people who are paying you to do that. But just don't stop helping people. So mm-hmm. and honestly, like right now, checking in with people has been a big, just a big deal because the creative industry we are. And you said this earlier, our identity is I'm only as good as my last project. Mm. You know, I am I'm the guy who makes this. And if I don't make this anymore, who am I? Right. And that's a, from an identity standpoint, that's a crushing blow when I can't do 
who I am anymore. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it's really like you know, it's psychologically it is weird. It's yeah. hard. Mm-hmm. And so, granted, you know, you have all the the money loss. You know, we all like have our calendars, and we have all that. We see just all the red lines through all our stuff, and we can see like tangibly. Like last year was really good. Right. So you get like you think, oh, this is what's normal, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now cut all that off, and you had nothing in your future. Mm-hmm. And there's and so what you've been used to is going to be the exact opposite of that now. Mm-hmm. And all the the all the identity you had from that, and all the the self esteem, and all the, all the goodness you felt from yourself, that's all gone too. And so I had to realize pretty early on that I'm not my work. Yes, I'm just your identity is not my your identity work. wasn't there. And no. I think and that realization was, you know what, it, this happened to everybody. I'm not alone because it feels like you're alone. You feel like you're the only one who's failing right yep. now. But no, it's everyone's having a, a tough time right now. Mm-hmm. And so just knowing that there's other people out there, and then reaching out to people who were, and just knowing that you know it's a um, I built this from nothing, so I got nothing else. So as a creator, that's the thing. We can always create something that didn't mm-hmm. exist before. So you can yeah. pivot, yeah. offer a new service, learn a new, ha- you know, trade, build, build a new relationship, and that's go deeper you, with who you already are with your own and now inner the, circle, the, the your family. Now the is find out what's next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what's next for Brad Sitton? I mean, what's the future look like for you? What do you? What's got uh, you excited? What are you learning right now? What's next for for you guys? So I, I don't know. This is what I'm excited about right now. If it's the future, if I'm going to be good at this in five months, I don't know. But uh, virtual production is a real thing. Okay. And so, so we make games. And so for years, I've been looking at different game engines yep. and just saying, well, what are our options out there? And so there's a couple of them out there. And the two that kind of rise to the top are either Unity or Unreal. Mm-hmm. And Unity is more, it's more of an indie game. And then Unreal was more like what the big dogs were using. Yep. And so I was looking at both and just kind of exploring around that all of a sudden, The Mandalorian comes out. And I don't know if you've seen The Mandalorian, but it's freaking amazing. Yep. And a big chunk uh, yeah, of, that, chunk of, of that show are an LED wall. It's fantastic it's been, and fa- fascinating what they're doing. with the. And it's being fed by Unreal Engine. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, that's on my laptop right now. And so the future is it's photorealistic, real-time rendering. And just the thought of that is it, it's, it's amazing to think. Also and scary. It, if it, you think. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. so like, like, you don't know what's real, what's not real. That's right. And knowing the quicker you can solve that problem, know where to jump into, that's going to be a huge deciding factor of who, who's going to get the client, who's going to win the job. So the quicker you can be the front of that curve, it's kind of mm-hmm. Malcolm Gladwell, the outlier. Yep. So it's going to take. So if you can spend ten thousand hours figuring that out now, before someone else can spend you know thousand hours, yep. you can become the expert first, and the the person who's on the front of the curve is going to make is going to be the first one out there, and they're going to be more visible, so they get more clients, they'll make more money. So. Try to get on the front of the curve as quick as you can. Yeah. Because if you're on the front of the curve, you don't have to be the best if you're the first. We were doing projection mapping when people hadn't seen it before. We were blowing their minds. Mm-hmm. We were doing multi-screen playback at events before that was common. And it was freaking people out. And so we might not have been in the best one, but we did it first. Right. And if you can be first, you don't have to be the best. Someone will come later and, bl- and, and be better than you, but that's fine. We'll be on to the next thing by then. So that's my goal. How can people get a hold of you? Best way to reach you, um, uh, so social I, media, otherwise? Yeah, what's the- I have a, like, so Brad Sitton is, uh, is on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, website, uh, blisterstudio.com. Okay. It's got my reel and stuff if you want to go look on that. And I try to do, like, behind-the-scenes stuff. So if you are in, into event production, I do like so I try to do, like, behind-the-scenes whenever I do a big event. I do two or three a year. Okay. And just, you know, just kind of show you some, you know, some oddities. And then uh, if you're into the gaming world, if you have a, a game, uh, crowdcontrolgames.com, you can kind of see what we've been building over there. Awesome, man. Well, this has been exciting. I'm sure uh, people at home or people wherever on the office watching have learned as much as we have. And, dude, this has been inspirational. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you. Right. Appreciate it. All right. Thank there you, guys. Um, see you on the next episode. 